So we've probably heard the term Baroque before, and um, we often use it as a reference to music, to art, and primarily our time frame is the 17th century, okay? Now, uh, you know, I would usually write on the board. I'm not going to try to write on the board. I'm going to try to use my words and I'm going to write things in the chat if you need that. And almost everything I say is going to be supported um, that you need to know, supported in that Brightspace page. It already should be there to some degree. But when we talk about Baroque, when we talk about the history, we do tend to take the Baroque and split it into two for two reasons. The first one is, as we, I sort of mentioned quickly in the bright space, our fashion uh, vision in some ways does turn to France a bit to set the tone of what is happening. Now, does it not have references all over? Well, of course it does. But many of our best sourcing for the things that we're talking about tend to be French representation and French resources for these styles. Also, historically, we see a major shift happen in the middle of the Baroque, um, especially in the English monarchy, that then sort of separates idealistically what's happening and also thought of what's happening and, and develops into something slightly different, that we ultimately need to see this period kind of as two separate entities. And hopefully you yourself will see this as we're going along. So this Baroque broken into two, we call first the Cavalier, and then the second one we call the Restoration. Now, the Cavalier, is primarily up until 1660. So around 1620, 1625 to about 1660. Then the, uh, sorry, the restoration is around 1660. Some people push it as far as 1715. Some people kind of push it closer to the beginning of the 18th century. But to give you a sense that it is almost this one era that is broken in half. And here's what makes this kind of interesting. For those of you who were here for the review and here for first semester, um, you know that our eras that we talk about first start off as you know, hundreds or thousands of years. And then they start to move along and then it breaks into maybe you know, centuries and then centuries moves along and then it starts to move into maybe half centuries or 50 year totals then 20 year totals, then 10, if we think about the 20th century, we tend to think of it in decades, right? We tend to think of it as the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, not just because of historic costume where we actually see interesting timelines sort of categorically building up, again, the Victorian in me, but also we start to see manners and ideas change with each kind of new era. Um, think about today. What is our time frame today? Does anybody have sort of a thought about how we think about era now? Go ahead, Jordan. In terms of like fashion? Well, fashion, but also cyclical. Yeah, Owen, you know, presidencies certainly could have it. Decades, yes, we see at the beginning of the 21st century, you know, we sort of talk about the aughts and we talk about, I guess you could say the teens, but having lived them, do you see, and maybe Jordan, you can answer this one, do you see the teens, you know, now we're in the 20s, did you see the teens as feeling like a cohesive 10 year, things didn't change, whether through fashion or whether through spirit or such. Yeah, maybe we use generations. Sure, Alana, yes, it feels different every time because we're in it, right? And it is that stupid Victorian sensibility that, that I have at least and many other sort of costume historians have where we wanna try to figure out what is the silhouette? What is the, what is the big overarching feeling? And we may look back as your adults and see, oh, 
it actually was split into two. I like to use the 1960s as sort of the example of this, because we think of 20s as this big idea. We think of 30s, 40s, maybe 50s. But when we think about the 60s, and you know, we can talk about it historically, we can also talk about it as far as clothing goes, but we kind of break it down into two sections of the 60s. What is our first sort of knee-jerk reaction when I say the 1960s? What do you think of? What do, what's kind of your, your, your visuals? 1960s. Okay, housewife, certainly. Uh, Woodstock, mods and rockers, sure. Mods, yeah. We tend to think of that sort of more modern, you know, the mods leading into the hippies as the 60s. But if you think about it, the 60s really started with the Kennedy era, right? So, so they're kind of two or almost three parts by the time we get to the 60s that really help identify the spirit or the energy. That was just America. Certainly every country is slightly different. And so as we look at it, we do try to look at it from the outside to say, were there significant changes in that era? You know, if you look at the 70s, there are a couple different sections. When we look at the 80s, the 80s that you all probably think of when, you know, you're thinking of, um, of maybe going to a 1980s costume party or such, is you tend to think of the later 80s, kind of 85 to, you know, 1990s, say, um, where I tend to think of, you know, first stage, kind of a second stage and a third stage. So it, it's all in the eye of the beholder, but we start to see because of technology, because of communication, because we're sharing information much more, we tend to see clothing, ideas, music, thoughts changing as well. So this one, even though it is, you'll see books that are just the 17th century, or you'll see books that are just called Baroque art, we do see two very different eras within this Baroque. Now, does anybody know where the word Baroque comes from? It's kind of, it's kind of an esoteric thing. I, I, if you don't, it's okay. But it's from the, um, from the Portuguese Baroco, and it's uh, the Spanish also use the word Baroco, and the French use the word Baroque, which means irregular pearl. And I love to have this image in your mind for the Baroque period. Imagine a pearl, you know, as, as we saw it, say in the Elizabethan, these beautiful, perfect, round, shiny, spherical items. But then think more of what we Americans often will call a freshwater pearl or sometimes that kind of gnarled pearl that's maybe sometimes shaped like a, 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 a piece of rice, a grain, I guess you could say of rice, or sort of squished or twisted or little notched. It still has exceptional beauty. However, it has a personality all unto its own. And in its irregularity, we're sometimes forced to look at it as a natural thing instead of a perfect thing, if that makes sense. And so in art, we also see a great deal of interest in things not being overly perfect, having flaws, having, um, if you think about like say still life from the Baroque period, we often see things in a way that I'm not gonna say look rotten, but look as they really do. They're not trying to gloss it over as much. And so I like that image of that irregular pearl. My Portuguese and my Spanish are not perfect. So please, um, yes, perfectly imperfect in every way, um, uh, unlike Mary Poppins. But the, the Baroque itself is beautiful, it is, spectacular, it has a great deal to say, but it's leading to one of the periods that I think is somewhat perfect. And we'll talk about in a lot of ways how art and everything aligns when we're talking about that. Now, again, a big feeling that I like you to think about 
um, when we're talking about the Baroque period is there's a great deal of passion. There's a great deal of energy. There's a great deal of spirit. And certainly one of the terms that we use historically to talk about this period is the counter-reformation, right? So the reformation, if you don't know, was when we started to reform the idea of religion and started to include or develop the ideas of Protestantism, Calvinism, and such. And in some ways, people look at this counter-reformation to be the Catholic Church sort of trying to step in and say, no, we're going to build things that are be more beautiful and more exciting, and they're just going to be so stylish that you're going to want to be here. I'm so glad you weren't in the room because I just spit everywhere. Sorry. Uh, and it's sort of to, to reinvigorate this richness and this glory. And so when we think of the Baroque and its perfectly imperfect nature, we're going to see in some ways a, a transition into understanding our relationships to the things that we wear, to the things that we hear, to the things that we see. And it will slowly start to change over the course of this whole century. But as I said, we do mark it out into a big chunk. Now, one of the things also, and I guess you could think of it as more of, again, kind of the spirit is an, a starting of understanding the individual within the context of this. Are we in the age of enlightenment? Not really, but we're building the aspects that will lead to a lot of self-reflection. And so there is to some degree a spirit and an energy of living life to its fullest. And I use that word full often when I'm talking about this, not just because it's full skirts or full sleeves, but also there's kind of a richness and a, a meatiness, I guess one could say, not only to the art and to the music, it often for some reason reminds me of kind of uh, uh, food in a lot of ways, this kind of delicious, um, exceptional, um, almost, uh, what's a good word? What's a good word? Almost um, um, a decadence to it. Will it get better? In, you know, for my opinion, yes, they will, they will define it, but there is something so exciting about that. And I like to think of one of the artists of this period to really introduce you to it. Now I'm gonna say names, I'm gonna talk about art or I'll talk about things. I'm not gonna show representations here because I want you to sort of take it all in and not focus on the visuals right now. But <clears throat> we talk about an artist in this period called Rubens. So has anybody ever heard of Rubens before? Maybe a hands up or a, a why in the chat, okay? So does anybody want to give me a sense of, of why we think about Rubens? Why we talk about that work? Go ahead, Fiona. Oh, I wasn't answering for that. It was just the, if you knew the name. Oh, okay. About a heist. Oh, because somebody stole it. Well. So Rubens, one of the things that's really interesting about his artwork is many of his models, especially his women, but you do see it in his men as well, is that they often have a roundness, a richness, um, kind of a fleshiness to them that is very different than the art we have seen before. You know. Um, more of the figures tend to be rounded. They tend to, especially the women, have fuller chests, rounder hips, um, perhaps maybe not even what we would consider to be, um, you know, that stick model fin that often we're, we're, we um, sort of look to when we look at art. And so he inspires kind of this, this softness, I guess you could say. Even today, we do sometimes use the term Rubenesque for
for a woman who is more curvy. Um, and it is, I think, um, his, his work is often, again, kind of sensual, kind of decadent, and there is kind of a lushness to it. So I use these sort of words to give you, you know, to sort of uh, get you to get the sense of the world that we're living in. Now, it is not with, you know, it isn't just all happy, happy, joy, joy at this time, though. We have a lot of different historical events happening that do cause challenges. So certainly there's the 30 years war that is running during this time. And if you go to the Bright Space page, you want a little bit more history. I usually use um, Crash Course for most of my historic context videos, partially because they are not by any stretch um, pretentious. I don't think they talk down to people. I think they tend to be exceptionally smart, but a little funny and, and give you, you know, the highlights of the period without necessarily getting too um, vague about things. And then the second video, at least for this one, is how the close and the period, the era, the history, sort of mirror each other without getting into too much detail. Because that's why you got me, right? I'm the one that's, that's laying down the terms and the detail of the things that we're looking at. But we're in the middle of the 30 Years War, which was a huge conflict and was incredibly difficult for uh, mainland Europe to navigate around. We're also having challenges because within both England and France, we're seeing a separation of society in some ways in how they see themselves within the context of that country. So maybe one might even think about it similarly to the era that we're in. Um, and I use this, it's probably going to be a bad metaphor. You know, Charlotte hates my bad metaphors, but we are in a lot of ways, a nation divided. And it isn't just um, that some people have super strong ideas. We can see through the things that have been happening for the past couple of years, um, you know, a very strong kind of uh, philosophical difference between one group of people and another group of people. And because both are relatively headstrong and believe very strongly in their beliefs, um, it, it makes for very difficult conversations. Now, ours tends to be more about society. In this time, it's more about religion. And we know that religion, and you know, again, bringing up that idea of the Counter-Reformation, religion has had a very difficult time going forward. But this was the time of the Great Civil War um, in England. And certainly in France, we see people butting heads as to what is right based on religion. And that can be very difficult. Um, how many people have ever read or seen a production um, or movie of The Three Musketeers? What if I saw the Pink Panther version? Um, I will give you a credit and a half for that one. How's that? I'll take credit and a half. Credit and a half. Um, Awesome. Okay, so some of you have had some context with it, but the, what's interesting about that, first of all, it does take place very clearly in the Cavalier, um, and The Three Musketeers is a 19th century book that references the 17th century, so we have to be careful there because it's romanticizing it, but it is in a lot of ways using this idea of a split world in we have the king, and we have the cardinal, right? We see the three musketeers, which generally are considered to be of a Protestant base versus the, the cardinal's guards who are from the Catholic base. And we see some challenges there between the musketeers and the, um, and the cardinal's guards, you know, making a sort of playful, because um, uh, it is, it, it doesn't get too serious, but makes a playful uh, challenge between the two. But in truth, it is very complicated and very serious in that people are dying, especially in England. And we certainly know that that civil war has a great deal of um, 
breadth to that. Now, in France, we start our Louis, okay? And you've probably heard of one or more of the Louis Kings, and we're gonna be talking primarily about four of them. In the first section, interestingly, which tends to fall right in that cavalier is, is Louis the 14th, or sorry, Louis the 13th. And Louis the 13th had um, an exceptional court. Now, what do I mean when I talk about a king and his court? His advisors. Okay, they can be his advisors or their advisors or her advisors if it is a queen. What else is the court? His posse, yes. Other nobles, correct. Erin, you wanted to say something? I was gonna say, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the dukes and the duchesses and all that, but like all the sure. people are part of that. All the, yes, exactly. They are all of the people that surround the, the, the monarch. Um, some in a much more, I guess you could say, a uh, uh, clerical role or a um, uh, an advisor role when we think of more of a, a job. But just like Alana was saying, and even when we're talking about dukes and duchesses, in some case, cases, they are just people to curry favor or to look good in the eyes, the social circle of the king. And so there are often many voices being brought into this world of the court. And because court itself gets formalized in many ways during this period, it will have many weird rules and reputations that will, you know, sort of develop during this period. And we also have this idea of, um, as, and we certainly know this as we head into the 18th century of the French monarchy, some challenges because we see in some ways that these monarchs aren't often as serious about their position as perhaps the people would like them to be. And we see a great deal of time spent on um, relaxation, spent on getting away of vacations and such. And during this period is when the idea of Versailles starts to become a place of importance, especially for that court, a, a, a getaway, one might say, out of the city limits. And it was first sort of developed as a hunting shack. And when you see illustrations of it, it is a pretty modest uh, abode. As the 17th century and the 18th century develop, it turns into, you know, the, you know, Aspen of the day, you know, with multiple residences in multiple places. And we're going to sort of connect to Versailles every once in a while when we talk about the, the French monarchy and such. Now, Britain had some issues as well. And certainly we talk about Charles I in reference to this cavalier period. Now, England at this time breaks up into three very distinct sections where we have, you know, the, the rule of Charles I. Then we have a short section in there that we call the Commonwealth. And then we have the third section, which we call the Restoration. And the Restoration is very important because it changes the, the sort of system and the thought about what is a monarch. But in Charles I's life, um, and I use the term life because very shortly after uh, he becomes king, while well, short in the, the big picture of it, everything about being a monarch is threatened and is challenged. And eventually he is beheaded and eventually the Commonwealth takes over. And the challenge of that is all of society sort of moves to, in some ways, a much more secular view of what is society. Because the king still is tied very strongly in a lot of ways to, um, to religion. And the Commonwealth tends to be, in some ways, a repositioning of 
in a very strange way, more puritanical ideas of what is happening. Now, again, religion is part of that, but they're trying to figure it out. Now, if we even want to talk about sort of the connection between Britain and America, we certainly know that in 1620, the, you know, the, the, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, however you would like to choose to call them, you know, leave England because of how chaotic it is, again, civil war, and move, you know, to America to in, infest this great land that we have now. Uh, but in doing so, colonizers, exactly, exactly. Um, and in doing so, if they probably, this is again, one of those David things, if they had just stayed where they were, probably they would have found a, a more ideal situation to some degree during that Commonwealth because there was a great deal led into that. Um, but I bring those people up because ultimately we have a vision of who those people are, right? We have been told through cartoons, we've been told through uh, statuary, what these people look like. And in a lot of cases, that's not true. Unfortunately, most of those are, again, Victorian illustrations and ideas of who these people were. And we have this idea that, that is, will be challenged in some ways based on the things that we're talking about. So just keep that in mind, okay? Um, and ultimately, this idea of expansion becomes incredibly important to everybody because we certainly know about the French, we certainly know about the Spanish, we certainly know about the Portuguese, we so certainly know about um, you know different groups trying to, in a sense, find, and we know that that is already that this land had already been found but in their minds find these new worlds uh, um, which were actually in many cases older worlds and older cultures than the people who try to quote unquote colonize um, those areas um, so it is a very complicated time um let's see louis the 13th did that i got my little notes here little notes I'm an old man, I need my notes. Um, Spain in the um, 16th century had been a major player, but because of a lot of issues with how they were spending money, certainly when we think about the Inquisition, when we think about the many, many um, travels that they did across the sea, they started to lose much of their prestige and their power within the sort of um, uh, system, I guess you could say. And what is interesting is they do visually, both through art and through clothing, sort of separate themselves a little bit from um, the, the sort of um, pattern, I guess you could say, of fashion history. And it is very interesting to see how these sort of separate ever so slightly and what happens in Spain actually becomes something that does have um, influence in another period um, as we're going along. So that is sort of important to remember that Spain, um, Spain's influence starts to, to lower just a little bit. But then there's one other important aspect that we really need to think about, which is this idea of what is East? What is beyond um, the Western sort of area of Europe? Now, what do we know? We like pretty shiny things. We like, um, and especially in this period, we like things that are um, sensual. We like things that are expensive. And so, you know, our eyes turn again to to Asia as they often do for products such as silk, such as eventually cotton. Now, silk, the silk trade, huge story that goes along with that, which we obviously don't have time to do and I would probably botch it within its own entity. But the idea of trying to understand how silk is made 
And starting to cultivate silk becomes incredibly important for the fashion industry. Now, in the past, they had looked to Japan, China, other parts of Southeast Asia to develop this because all of the all of the 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 climate, the 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 processes, everything had been cultivated for so long that it was practically perfect. Um, it was perfect, and so um, they knew that they couldn't do any better. So they, you know, would import. They would bring these these things from these countries. We're going to talk about silk production in just a second for those of you who may not know about it, but eventually China, or sorry, Japan closes its doors to the Western world, closes its doors away. And for, you know, 200 years, basically decides that they are not going to have any relationship with anybody from anywhere else. And it's really fascinating. So ultimately in every way, sorry, Jordan, what do you mean in every way? No, because you said practically perfect. And I was oh, like, it is practically, yes, yes, sorry. <clears throat> um, no, silk is perfect. And I'll tell you when we get to the, the silk story in a second, why it is perfect. But um, ultimately, when Japan closes itself down, first of all, we need to look other places. We need to look for other places to get things from. And also it makes the things that were brought from Japan even more valuable and have much more um, status to them. So we can see how that can influence what's happening. And the word that most people use until recently is this word chinoiserie, which is a word I don't like to use in class. I like to use the word either Japanese inspired, Chinese inspired, Indian inspired, um, uh, you know, Thai inspired to really try to give more of that idea of, of where that cultural idea truly came from. And if I know the actual country or sorry, the province or the prefecture, sometimes that also um, can be very important for us to understand those cultures. But you have to imagine that once that closes down, we've lost something. And so what people turn to is the luxury good of cotton, right? Hopefully you're sort of tilting your head a little bit or sort of going, how is cotton a luxury good? Well, up until this point, they did not have access to a great deal of cotton. It needed to be brought from India and people were still trying to figure out what's its story. Most of the undergarments, see, you can see me today. so. Most of these undergarments, our chemise, our shifts that we're wearing, those would often, those would be made out of linen because that was something that was available. But now cotton becomes one of the most interesting forms of, of textile that we will use. And again, I try to use the word textile to reference this, what we might call fabric, something that is either woven or knit. I try to use textile. Please try to do that as well because material, anything is a material, right? Wood is a material, uh, metal is a material. So I try to use textile to really get to the point of it. Now, let's talk quickly about textiles. So what do we know about textiles? I'm going to, I said I wasn't gonna use the board. I am gonna use the board. I did get new curtains. So hopefully there won't be as much reflection on the board. I'm still trying to use the Blackboard function in, um, in this, and I, I, I don't like it yet. I'm gonna, I have a couple ideas, but I want it to be perfect. Can we see this? Can we see the word silk, maybe? Like kind of, but not super okay. well. I'm just... You know what, because it's part of my rhythm, I will write it down. Most of these words shouldn't be too difficult. But this idea of silk is what we call a protein fiber. Why do we call it a protein fiber? Because it grows from, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say because it's made from an animal. 
Right, because it comes directly from an animal. What is another form of protein fiber? Cotton. Wool. Nope. Nope. Wool. Nope. Wool. Nope. So yeah. they both come from animals, right? We have silk, which comes from silkworms, and wool, which comes from the hair of animals. Now, the thing is, leather can be woven, but it is not a textile. It is used as its individual material more often than not. So it, it doesn't quite fall into the idea of fiber because we tend not to use it as a basis for a yarn or for a continuous fiber. Most of those forms in, um, in wool, and wool can be from any animal, the hair from any animal. So it could be goats, it could be sheep, it could be humans, it could be cats, it could be anything, okay? But it's taking these small hairs that all of these animals have, cutting them, twisting them. Hopefully you've all been to some sort of like spinning world to sort of see where that goes. But you take them and you twist them and you create an individual yarn. You take that yarn, you can either weave, and again, weaving is taking threads, running them one way, and then weaving in and out with another thread to create textile, right? We all know the basics of textile. We all probably made um, pot holders in kindergarten or something like that, or did some sort of weaving project where we basically know the idea of it. Silk, however, still a protein fiber, but what is different about the way that we have the thread or the fiber itself? It's not made up of little hairs. What is it made of? The silk from worms. Okay, how do we get it? In a very invasive way. <laughs> Well, it can be pretty evasive. Okay, so yes, Rachel, the, the, they're boiled, but what is boiled? Yes, Fiona, the cocoons. So when we think about metamorphosis, and I always bring up, you know, all these things that we probably learned in science class and biology and chemistry, there's a lot of chemistry this semester. We understand that process of, you know, a moth or a butterfly and then a, or sorry, a Becoming a moth or a butterfly requires a magical process in which a, a worm, a, a caterpillar spins a cocoon around themselves, right? And where that's all being extracted and this thread sort of wraps around themselves and wraps around, then they become a gelatinous mess. And then eventually they break through that cocoon, right? Fly away, fly away little butterfly. The, the cocoon of the silk worm is a continuous thread, right? So we can unravel that thread and use it to create long individual pieces of these fibers to weave with. We will take two or three sometimes and twist them into a yarn, but ultimately they are so long that we don't have to do this kind of overlapping of all these hairs. And so that's what makes it incredibly interesting is because we're using these long lengths, we can create long garments. And because it is a very super fine thread and it has a sheen, once it's woven, it has this incredibly delicate and beautiful texture to it. What is also great about silk, it takes color exceptionally well. So even in an era in which color is still used from, you know, we don't have writ dye, we're still using natural elements. It takes these colors and elevates them and makes them incredibly bright. And because it has that sheen, you can weave it in different ways to maximize and minimize that sheen. Now, just a, one other quick set is you can actually use broken cocoon as well for silk and that we call silk noil or raw silk and what happens is you take piece silk i don't know piece silk is a term 
Huh. Uh, but what you do is you take that broken part and just like hair, you sort of twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it. And eventually that becomes a yarn. So it's very similar like individual hairs. And then that yarn is then woven. And, and uh, raw soap or soap oil is one of my favorite textiles. So beautiful to work with. It works like cotton, but it has a beautiful drape just like silk. You know, it's very spongy and very soft. But both of these, both the wool and the silk being protein fibers, their intention is to be insulating, right? It's to warm or to keep the animal, the creature warm. And so when we think of silk, we often think of this lightweight textile, but its intention is to keep us warm and to lock in moisture and lock in heat. Um, so be very careful about that. Sometimes if you wear those um, garments during the summer, silk garments, you find that they actually are sometimes uncomfortable. Even though their physical weight is lighter, they may stay you know, in your body a different way. They are intended to insulate, so keep that in mind. Now, next to that, we have the plant fibers or what we call cellulosic fibers. And the two that we tend to think of previous to today's conversation was primarily linen. And linen is a stalk. Think of, um, I try to always make these as simple as possible. They're beyond this. But think of a piece of celery, right? You know, when you eat celery, there's sort of those strings that are in there. That is similar in some ways to flax or to eventually linen. So what they do is they use those um, those strings, I guess you could say, and in the same way, twist them to create these garments, to create textile that eventually can be worn. Another one, and this is primarily developed and used in Asia, which is very similar and is still used today, is something called rami. I'll write it down. Again, you don't have to remember this. This is context, but it's, it's interesting to me, at least. I still have you for another 15, well, 20 minutes, so I feel like I can say it's interesting. But rami is kind of a grass, very similar, that can be broken down into various fibers. And what makes rami really interesting is it can get woven with other textiles, primarily linen, primarily um, rayon, which is a whole different thing. We talk about that later in the semester, um, and cotton, and even in some cases, silk and wool. And it is kind of the tofu of the textile world in that, you know, you might think of it as a filler, but it, it actually sort of takes on some of the characteristics of the things that it is woven with. It really works well with cotton. It really works well with linen and in some cases, silk. Um, so, you know, this idea of a plant fiber is very popular, but those are longish sections. Cotton, however, is different. And in some cases they call cotton, cotton wool, because the way, hopefully we know this, um, but the way it, it blooms, you know, it sort of opens up and it's this little gnarl of, of tiny fibers that again, then are twisted, 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 comb, twisted, 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 and ultimately created in the same manner that one might look at wool, um, but eventually becomes an incredibly useful textile for, you know, for all. And again, how is there anybody in this room right now that is not wearing something made of cotton? Yeah, I don't see any hands jump up to sort of go in. Yes, we do have synthetics. We do have things now like that are made from chemicals like polyesters and, and lycros and things like that. But ultimately cotton has become, as we say, the textile of our lives or the fabric of our lives, um, that it is so universal, it's impossible for us to sort of imagine that. So we think about protein fibers, we think about these, these cellulosic fibers, how they're woven, in some cases even how they're mixed, can be incredibly un, uh, useful. Now, when we talk about this period specifically, the Cavalier, there is a sort of contrast emotionally of using both luxury items and common items. 
and trying to mishmash them together in some ways. Then we're going to see items made of silk, but items, items made of cotton, items made of wool, items made of linen, and worn in many, many different uh, connections overall. But here's the last part about cotton that is useful. Um, we have cotton in our lives and we use woven cotton for all sorts of things. But it is during this period that many of the textile traditions of India start to enter our world as textiles that we sort of use. One of those words is calico. So has anybody ever heard of that word before calico? And how do we use it? Um, how do we use it in relationship to textiles? Hey, there we go. How do we use it in relationship to textiles today? Any guesses? Okay, only for cats. Well, it actually comes from textiles. And in fact, because this is what I like to do, this is calico. This is a cotton print in which we have an overall design on it that is relatively small and repeated. And we see that in some, um, in Indian textiles, specifically from Calcutta. And so this idea of calico, can you see that pretty, pretty well? It's, it's like all the shirts I wear kind of every day, if I can, with small prints on them. Where most people sort of have more context for it are, um, uh, uh, sorry, quilts that are made in the traditional manner. Those textiles we often call calicos, right? A plain background with then like very small flowers on it. And that's a sort of more American understanding of the word, but the word comes from Calcutta where they would sort of print with blocks uh, a repeating print on a textile all the way down. We have the word chintz. Has anybody ever heard the word chintz before? I always think of the cowardly lion when he's doing the song and he says, not, and he's saying all the, the materials, what his outfit will be made of when he's king of the oh, forest. Oh, right. And he says, not chintz. And he says it in that way. And I had to look it up uh, when I got a little older to figure out what it was. Cause I was like, what is that that he's talking about? So that's okay. where I relate it to. <laughs> okay, great. No, it's lovely. That's a lovely, excellent um, example. Chintz is a cotton. So imagine any sort of woven cotton that we may have for say a dress shirt or something. But on top of it, they put a glaze they put, um, you know, uh, starches and things and basically really buff it up so that it has a shine to it, a shimmer to it that is intended to give the appearance of silk. If you imagine silk has a natural shine to it. Do I have any silk here? I have one piece. This is an old costume, but you can kind of see some, can you see some shine on this? a little bit, that there's a little bit of, of reflection off of it. Well, chintz uses starches and other natural things to make it look like it has a shine. Um, we always talk about chintz when we talk about country homes. And some of you, maybe in your home or your grandma's home or some other house, may have these kind of overly floral curtains made out of cotton, but are kind of have a plasticky covering on them. Um, not like a plastic, I'm going to protect this, but kind of a, it feels like it's part of it. And that's the word chintz. Now, some of us use it colloquially as well, chintzy, to mean something feels cheap. And so, doing a full circle, as Aaron was talking about, he's using the term chi uh, chintz to reference that it would be cheap right, a cheap textile, um, something that isn't glamorous. Yeah, Aaron. I don't think your mic's on. Didn't there unmute you. myself, thank you. Um, so is calico a print that goes on chintz? If, am I understanding that or no? No, there, the, we generally think of them as two different types of textiles. So mm -hmm. as I said, 
like my shirt is calico, but it's not chintz. Mm. It's just a print on a cotton broadcloth. Okay. Chintz could be a print. Mm. It's, it's mostly referring to this idea of glazing cotton so it has a silk-like appearance. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Mm -hmm. And then we also have this general term, muslin. And many of you have probably worked with muslin before. And the idea of muslin is that it is just plain woven cloth. Is your hand up again, Aaron? Or is it still there? No, it was just still there. Okay. I moved my screen and all of a sudden I saw this little hand pop out. So, And that, you know, many of us in theater use it for all sorts of things, whether it's drops, whether it's um, costumes, we'll often use muslin, which is an unbleached natural cotton to mock up clothes and such. So we get some international um, influence into the things that we're wearing. Um, and so we see a lot of interest in these uh, cultures um, as we're sort of uh, going along. Um, just so you know, Japan closed in 1639 and wasn't reopened until 1854. So again, almost 200 years. And if there are any musical theater fans out there, there's a musical that is written about this, about this moment. Anybody know it? It's what we're gonna be listening to before Intro to Design today. Anybody in Paula's class? Because <laughs> if you're in Paul's class, you're probably going to hear about it too. It's called Pacific Overtures, which is specifically about when China, or geez, Japan closed their doors to all countries outside. And then eventually in the 19th century started to open up their doors to trade with America, with Europe and such. So really interesting, interesting musical. Okay. So that is the big, sort of the big idea of all these little things coming together. The dates are important, again, in the biggest picture of it to understand. But again, we have reference to that. We used to have to memorize a lot more information because we couldn't instantly recall those things right from us. We couldn't carry our books with us. You have that access now. So keep that in mind. But it is nice to know historically where those dates sort of front and end. Now, when we talk about art of this period, it is a very long period art-wise, but certainly as I had mentioned before, Rubens. Rubens is an incredibly influential artist at this time. One of the, I mean, in art circles, still pretty big, but one of the people that I love, especially for clothing, is an artist called Franz Halls. Um, Beautiful work, beautiful, beautiful work. And we're gonna see some of that work in the slideshows. Um, one of his paintings is incredibly, incredibly popular. In Spain, um, one of the artists that's very popular is Velázquez or Velázquez. Um, and that is incredibly important in the big picture of how we look at art of the time. And then the last thing I wanna get to is theater. And what makes this difficult is during this time, theater takes a turn in many ways. The 18, or sorry, the, oh my gosh, the 17th century is known for a great deal of theater and types of theater, specifically the work of the restoration artists, which are going to come later, and Moliere, right? But that tradition comes from a lot of different places, but it also comes as a reaction because during the Commonwealth, theaters were outlawed. In France, theaters had to close because they were considered to be, and if you are taking Rachel's class, you'll get to learn all about it, but um, there are issues with how we look at, yes, neoclassicism, excellent, the theatrical tradition. And as we move through the 17th century, we develop this idea of the well-made play. We develop this idea of what is theater and how is it presented um, and the chaos that comes from it. 
changing into um, a very well structured format for theater. We also see during this period, the interest in the development of opera. Um, it will never be quite the way that we, because we tend to think of our opera traditions being more of an uh, seven, sorry, 18th and 19th century world, but we start to see it develop in this period to become the classic styles that we see. Um, and so art, music, the, um, I use, when I say art, I meaning like, visual arts and theater and the arts in general start to become um, a unique and exciting experience. And in some ways it's like a fifth Renaissance, you know, because people are really investing in art and investing in the world and want to show, you know, sort of the ripeness and the energy that is coming from this. Okay, finally, from when we come from Elizabethan, as we saw last time, we actually passed through a very small section that we call the Jacobean, which as far as clothing is concerned, isn't quite as important as the work that comes out of the Jacobean. However, we start to see a relaxation. Okay, remember all these things that we talked about, but we see a relaxation in the way that we present ourselves. Now, is it still more formal than we ever wear on a daily basis? Yes, however, in their eyes, it is almost going from, um, let's imagine in today's society, suits, tuxedos and evening gowns to athleisure, okay? Their clothes in some ways reference a need for movement, for activity, for um, sort of living life. And so we'll see a great deal of the formal aspects of what we wore before starting to melt away and starting to become much more casual. As I say, not fully casual to us, but certainly to that society, we will see that. We start to get a sense of identity through clothing and a sort of freedom in how we wear clothes. But one of the challenges we will always come up against are sumptuary laws. This is the last thing I'm gonna leave us with today. Everybody, I've told you about my E key and my space bar, right? They double and it makes it look like, um, makes it every time I write the, it writes the, and I have to write a note. <laughs> it takes me like 20 minutes to like edit any document that I'm writing. But um, sumptuary laws. And the idea of sumptuary laws is to keep societies structurally using only certain textiles for certain groups of people or certain decorative devices for certain groups of people. And because this period starts to become like every anything goes as far as what clothing is, we see a rise in sumptuary laws to determine only certain people can wear this color. For example, um, and this has been sort of a tradition, but only royalty can wear purple. That is a significant color textile um, use that, that is reserved for royalty. So, so purple, they try to say only royals can wear purple. The only exception is high ranking officials in the church. Now, why did this happen? Well, because it used to be really expensive. So it was really only reserved for um, the wealthy and eventually, people started to figure out how to do purple in other ways. And then it, it is basically saying, well, this, you know, you're taking over. So they want to control people by making laws about what you can wear and what you cannot wear. And so things like lace, things like um, the way clothes are cut or the textiles that they're made from often get sort of not ruled, but developed into this idea of what you can within your culture, within your cast say wear or not wear. So keep that in mind as we're talking about it um, through some of these periods, how sumptuary laws are used to sort of control the common people, especially in this period where it is, you know, sort of anything goes. And we start to see this melting of the formality. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes. Any questions about those things? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We certainly do. We certainly do see that. Um, and certain, um, you know, if we want to talk about gatekeepers of certain items or certain things, we tend to use price and price point is that sort of story versus um, styles. But, you know, when you, you, um, specifically hear about like factories, right? Who are building right next door to each other in the same place often where the workers do not make as much money as they should, but they're making, you know, a shirt for Gucci right next to a shirt for Old Navy. And they're basically using the same materials and the same stuff. They're just doing it a little bit quicker. You know, we get a sense of status through that. Um, but also as, as Alana points out, but also with body types. So you want to, you want to give us a little bit on that one, Alana, how you see that? So I just think of like traditional, like, especially like growing up, um, and like, as a woman there, there are things that like, oh, because you have, you're fuller, you should wear something that's more like, um, fit to your body. So it shows off your curves versus, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I'm talking like more in like that experience in that realm of like yeah. and, and the diversity of body types and the diversity of how, you know, we have, and, and this is always the issue. And it's usually the olds telling the youngs, you shouldn't wear that when I was, you know, uh, young, uh, you know, boys didn't wear makeup. You know, but the, we were looking at those sort of in, uh, those incredible artists of the 1980s, you know, who were wearing eyeshadow, right? Now, or and, and eyeliner, nobody thinks anything of that. That is, you know, that's breaking that perhaps norm. And now we see people saying, I'm going to wear things the way that I want to wear them and I don't need anybody's approval. And we've started to see designers sort of open up, and I hope you agree with this, open up to the idea of, you know, that, that individual bodies can wear anything, right? Have you considered having a different body? Yeah. Well, one size fits most is really, you know, what those things should say. I mean, uh, and, and there is something sort of shaming about that because if you don't fit in that then no it does not fit all and then in turn am i not all you know um yeah and we can see challenges with that because you know for those of you who are tmd majors you know the the complications of creating clothes that they're often scaled right they're often based on one element and for women it's usually what is your your broadest part, which is often either your chest or your hips. If you're thinking about like a, an individual garment, we see this with menswear too, the chest and say in some cases, the waist. Uh, and because everybody is different, we're starting to see different designers take a different route of what is that body and what is the shape. Well, there are actually companies that do do women's um, trousers in the same manner as they do men's, but it would need another measurement as well. And this is where I think women's clothes have come much further. And I could be wrong. I buy an awful lot of women's clothes in my life, but it are little denote, uh, notes like curvy. It is, you know, slim or things to sort of reference what is the relationship of the waist to the hip that often can help us determine how this may fit on someone's body. But here's the other thing, women often care much more about their fit and are judged more about the fit of their clothes than often men are. I mean, I can wear three different sizes of trousers and most people don't think about it or care about it. You know, so I think, well, I mean, we do care about fit, but not to the same degree that, that I think women understand um, how clothing approaches their bodies, you know. Uh, let's see, uh, Europe does women's trousers. Yeah, they certainly do. Um, sorry, not to mention your chest can be bigger than your waist, yes. And you can be tall and skinny. Yeah, so you see a lot of companies really trying to embrace that, but the ultimate challenge there, we see this especially in fast fashion, is they're trying to make so many permutations that it's almost impossible for them 
to keep up. And that's why I often say to people, you should try on clothes from certain areas because they're going to fit differently. You know, even between say Gap and, and uh, uh, Old Navy and uh, Banana Republic. Sorry, I had to think of the, the triumvirate there. We can see many different sort of ways that those clothes are cut and shaped. Okay, it is time to go. So I'm not even gonna be able to see this, but have an awesome day. I will talk to you in groups um, on Tuesday, Tuesday group, and then Thursday group. So have a good day. Everything is on the bright space. Thank you for doing the survey. And I will see you next week. Bye, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Connor, you had a question? Nope, I guess not. I had a question real quick. Sure, Fiona. Um, are you splitting up 355 into a Tuesday group and a Thursday group? Not today. I did ask the same question, but not today. Okay. I was just wondering if we do end up splitting up, if I could be in the I same- I will try to, yep. Any student, if we decide to go to a split class, I will try to pair up the students who are in this class with, uh, or sorry, try to, to match up the 352 and the 355 option for you. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome.